Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yesudian, one of the dermatologists based in the UK. Today I thought I will talk about hair loss, which is a common condition that we all see in clinic. I will share with you my experience in managing this condition. Contrary to previous talks where I've mainly reviewed the literature, I plan to give you a practical overview of how to approach this clinical scenario. As is to be expected, my management strategy has changed over the last 15 to 20 years. Just one caveat, I will only be discussing diffuse non-inflammatory causes of hair loss and only skim the surface of this topic. So why is the hair so important? For every woman, and perhaps for men as well, hairs are their crowning jewels. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, that if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. I therefore empathize with all women who experience hair loss, as it can be a very distressing condition. The first point to note is that we should differentiate between hair fall and hair thinning. Now, this may seem very superfluous, but it's a very important distinction. Hair thinning is a gradual process where the patient does not actually experience much by way of hair fall. It's estimated that we should lose about 50% of our hairs before we actually notice the decrease in the density. So by the time anyone presents to us, there has been a fair bit of hair loss already. Thinning occurs more with the age of the skin and due to hormonal factors. Hair fall, on the other hand, is when excessive amounts of hairs are shed. This usually occurs due to physical or mental stress and is called telogen effluvium. Remember that about 100 to 150 hairs can be shed a day normally and there is a seasonal variation as well. Consistent hair fall above this throughout the year is considered pathological. My personal belief is that hair loss is multifactorial. Trying to address just one factor will not result in much improvement. In those who present to me, I have noted five major factors contributing to this condition. Firstly, systemic factors have to be looked at, including the diet and endocrine causes. Secondly, subtle local inflammatory changes in the scalp may contribute. Thirdly, hair grooming practices and trauma from it plays a role. Fourthly, stress is a major factor in hair loss. Finally, the aging process of the skin and the hormonal changes that accompany it also results in hair loss. Let's look at systemic factors. This includes nutritional and endocrine causes. Even though many nutritional causes have been implicated, I believe that the two ingredients that are most helpful to look at are iron and vitamin D. Those with heavy periods are likely to have low iron and this is best measured by looking at ferritin levels. Even though the normal ferritin level is about 20, for optimal hair growth, it needs to be about 70 to 100. Vitamin D is also crucial for hair growth. In temperate countries like the UK, vitamin D supplementation is mandatory, essential, from October to March when we change the times in our clock. This is because there's not enough sunlight to produce vitamin D that our body needs. Even in tropical countries like India, a good proportion of the population is deficient in vitamin D. This is because we do not go out much in the sun and also because we want to avoid getting a tan and therefore shun the sunlight which is on offer. Some food fashions and dieting can also play a role in nutritional deficiencies, so this has to be inquired in the history. Of the endocrine factors, an abnormal thyroid contributes to hair loss. Both hypo and hypothyroidism can cause hair loss. Given this information, practically speaking, two blood tests are helpful. Ferritin levels and thyroid function tests. Other investigations can also be considered if the clinical scenario suggests other nutritional deficiencies. Next is the role of subtle inflammatory changes in the scalp. There's good evidence to suggest that microinflammation weakens the hair follicles, leading to shedding of hairs. The commonest condition that we note in clinic is seborrheic eczema or dandruff. This is a universal finding and has to be addressed by regular shampooing with either ketoconazole or zinc pyrethrone or selenium sulfide containing shampoos. 
Ideally, the hair needs to be shampooed at least two or three times a week. Unless the scalp is clear of all scaling, the minimal inflammation will continue to weaken the hair follicles, resulting in hair fall. Trauma from various hair grooming techniques can also weaken the hair. I've done a talk on bubble hair syndrome, which gives valuable information on how hairs are weakened by excessive heat from hair dryers, straighteners, and curlers. These adverse environmental factors break the disulfide bonds in the hairs and make them be shed more easily. Remember that your hair can only take a certain amount of heat. So holding hair dryers a bit further away and letting it dry naturally may be beneficial. Hair styles where the hair is pulled very tightly or bunched together can also cause similar trauma and breakages. So be gentle with your hair when you're grooming it. Next is probably the most important aspect of hair loss, which is stress. When our body goes through physical stress, like illnesses, or mental stress, like a breakdown in relationship or bereavements, this causes our hairs to go into a resting phase. And then three months later, they are lost or shed. This is called telogen effluvium. Whenever we have more hair fall than hair thinning, then telogen effluvium is a major contributor to hair fall. Addressing the stress is vital. And again, I've done a talk in the past that may have a few points which are worth considering. Finally, the age of our hairs and hormones play a part. Aging is unfortunately not an optional process. We all have to get old and eventually we all die. And that's part of life. As our hairs age, they become thinner and the number of hairs from each follicle decrease from about three to just one. This is driven by certain hormonal changes. This is the reason why hair loss becomes obvious in two phases in a woman's life. The first is between the age of 25 to 45 during the reproductive phase. The next is between the ages of 50 to 60 when perimenopausal changes start to kick in. This affects the hair follicle and causes a regression and miniaturization of the hairs. Once we've addressed the first four factors that I've mentioned, then by exclusion, this is the only factor which is remaining and needs to be addressed. We can treat hair loss or thinning with many agents. Topical minoxidil is the most commonly used agent in the world. It's better to use the 5% solution of foam, and the foam is usually better tolerated. It has to be used for at least six months. Natural alternatives to minoxidil can also be considered. For example, I recently found out that rice water is affecting and stimulating hair growth, and I've done a talk on this. Remember to always take baseline images of the central parting and repeat it again every three months. If no objective change is noted photographically, then we can consider that it's not worked. Systemic factors like oral minoxidil, spironolactone, and finasteride can then be considered. These systemic agents, however, will need to be monitored by a dermatologist. This is just a brief overview of the way I manage hair loss in my clinic. As long as we address the five factors that I've mentioned, I believe that we can at least stop the future progression of hair loss, even if we cannot regrow the lost hairs. I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you for listening and bye.